And we're back. Welcome, Eat Denver, to the trying stage. It's Friday. The day's nearing an end, and uh, got my next speaker coming up. I seem to have forgotten my hat, although my next guest, Spencer from Hats Protocol, definitely hasn't. So everybody, please give a warm welcome to Spencer from Hats. All right, hello everybody. Thank you for coming. I know there's a ton going on right now, so it means a lot to me that you're all here. Uh, my name is Spencer Graham. I am a co-founder and protocol lead at Hats Protocol. And today I'm gonna talk about, shockingly, DAOs. Um, and what I'm gonna focus on primarily is what I've been more recently calling uh, full spectrum rule enforcement and why that is critical to enabling DAOs to fulfill their promise of becoming the best organizations that have ever existed. I think DAOs will win because they are able to enforce their rules with both what I'm calling constraint-based enforcement and accountability-based enforcement. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But first, we're going to take a very, very brief tour through a framework that I developed over the last few years uh, that comes from an article that I wrote just a couple of years ago that has informed a lot of the ways that I think about DAOs and governance and how we should go about making them better. And that framework is called anti-capture. And anti-capture begins with uh, first principles. And those first principles are resources. Really everything that you can think about is a resource in some way. Some of those resources are private. And what I mean by that is those resources are uh, held or controlled or, or owned by a single individual person. But other resources are shared, which means they are held or controlled or owned by more than one person. Two people, three people, 10 people, 10,000 people, seven billion people, as many as you can imagine can share a resource. And that distinction between private and shared resources is critical for our point uh, today. Resources, though, are only valuable, they're only useful if you use them. They're only important, they're only valuable if you can take actions with or on them. And this is really the core of anti-capture. It focuses on actions and the different phases of how actions are taken by either individual people or groups of people. And there's a lot more detail in the framework, um, but for the purposes of today, what's important is that uh, there, the different phases have different uh, vulnerabilities to uh, what I've been calling capture. Or there's, and there's also a trade-off between the ability to uh, pr uh, resist capture and actually execute actions. And it's the execution phase of actions that is really critical to ensuring strong uh, security and uh, strong properties of those resources. Uh, if, you'd, if you're interested in seeing more about uh, anti-capture in the framework, this QR code will take you to that article. And I encourage you to, to take a look at that. Resources brings us to organizations, especially shared resources. So my claim, which might be a little bit, um, a little bit uh, surprising, is that really this is all an organization is. An organization is a network of agents, a group of people, with some kind of collective or shared goals, and with resources that they share, and that the, the organization takes actions on or with those shared resources in order to achieve those goals. In some sense, this describes every organization across all time forever. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple idea, but I think it, it captures the essence of what organizations are. And this is also what we call governance, which is the process of taking collective action on or with shared resources to achieve common goals. 
governance has two primary objectives. In an organization, governance is attempting to uh, use its shared resources as effectively and efficiently as possible in order to achieve its goals. And we can call this effectiveness broadly. Uh, it also is trying to make sure that those shared resources are only used for achieving the organization's shared goals. That they are not captured and repurposed for some other, uh, some other objectives or for some other uh, entities. And that we call capture resistance. And there's a fundamental trade-off between effectiveness and capture resistance, at least to date, across all time and history, there has been. And that is, back to actions, the only way to use resources is to execute actions with them. But in the process of executing actions, you put those resources, you make those resources vulnerable to capture. So how do we be effective, do things we want to do, achieve the goals we want to achieve, while making sure that the resources don't get diverted to some other purpose, that they don't get captured? So how do organizations do this? I contend, or I'm, I'm sort of introducing a, a, a narrow definition of the concept of rules, which means, or, and the definition of rules is that they are the means by which organizations resist capture. They are the processes, the guidelines, the rules that organizations put into place to prevent capture of their resources while those resources are being used, while actions are being taken with their resources. So any good lawyer will tell you that in, uh, rules are only, are, are good, are, aren't good for anything. They're only rules if they can be enforced. How can rules be enforced? I think that there are two primary buckets or types of, of ways to enforce rules. One way, which is on the left of this spectrum, is what I've been calling constraints. Constraints are by their nature preventative. They are like physics. Constraint rules are unbreakable. You cannot break the laws of physics. You cannot, for all you might want to, you cannot break those rules. Recently, we've been able to introduce new types of constraints with cryptography, and more recently with crypt crypto economics via blockchains and smart contracts. New types of physics that allow us to, say, to make unbreakable rules with respect to our organization's shared resources. On the other side of the spectrum, we have what I've been calling roughly accountability. Accountability-based enforcement or accountability-based rules are retroactive by nature. They are incentives, they are penalties, they are punishments. But they also rely on multiple layers of accountability. If you reach all the way down, if you peel back all the layers of the accountability onion, what you primarily get at the end of the day is the state monopoly on violence. This is how organizations across all of history until DAOs operated. And this is a real big constraint that makes all these organizations fundamentally um, capturable by external actors like governments. They are susceptible to uh, or they are dependent upon governments for their own operations, which is, creates vulnerability, but it also creates a lot of inefficiency. It's very expensive. But on the other hand, accountability-based enforcement of rules is very flexible. It allows the, the, the people that are operating within the bounds of those rules to exercise their own judgment about what falls within those rules, which allows them to explore what they need to do and the actions they need to take in order to effectively uh, achieve their organization's goals. Constraints, however, are, are not very flexible. Again, like any uh, lawyer will tell you, every contract is incomplete. It is impossible to delineate all of the actions that we want to allow an agent or a person to take on behalf of an organization that is going to actually be effective, that, is going to, that are going to be in the realm of things that need to happen. So on one side of this spectrum, we have constraints, and on another side of this spectrum, we have accountability. So let, let's move into a slightly different formulation here. Let's return to this trade-off between capture resistance 
which is on the y axis here, and effectiveness, which is on the x axis. And if we, if we model these two, um, these two objectives in this way, we can borrow a tool from economics called the production possibility frontier, which allows us to describe and define and, and, and uh, diagram the trade-offs between uh, optimizing for one versus the other, or maybe a balance of those two. So here we can visualize the trade-offs between optimizing for capture resistance and optimizing for effectiveness. And we get this curve that represents the, the frontier of what we can do, the frontier of how good, how effective, how productive, how valuable, how impactful organizations can be. This is what I think traditional companies look like. They are pretty effective, generally. They've done a lot of good things, but they really sacrifice, or they don't, well, less sacrifice, more like they are not capable even of imagining what capture resistance is. They've never lived in a world where that was possible because they only are dealing with accountability-based uh, rule enforcement. This is what I think DAOs look like today or over the last five or, or six years in their, for, for their full existence. They have introduced this powerful idea of constraint-based rule enforcement, and that pushes up the frontier on the capture resistance axis. DAOs can now, relative to traditional organizations, be much more capture resistant for the same level of effectiveness, up to a point. You can see the curve of, of, for, for DAOs falls short of the level of effectiveness that traditional companies are able to access. And this is because they only have been able to rely on constraint-based rule enforcement. They cannot have the flexibility, the judgment, uh, they, they cannot enable the judgment of their individual members to act on their behalf because they literally cannot give them the, the flexibility and the extra space in which to operate. They are, they are uh, constrained to constraints. What would it look like if we could remove that constraint constraint? What would it look like if we could extend the frontier of the effectiveness axis? What could DAOs look like today and into the future? I think they could look like this. I think they, they could be the most effective organizations that ever existed. So how can we do that? How can we make that happen? That brings us to what I've been working on with a bunch of amazing people for the last couple of years, which is called Hats Protocol. Hats Protocol, or one way to think about it, is that it brings accountability-based enforcement back into the picture for organizations, back into the picture for DAOs. And it does this by using smart contracts to establish constraint-based rules to manage accountability-based enforcement of organizations' rules. It extends the frontier on the count accountability axis. So how do we do this? How does Hats Protocol do this? Hats Protocol is called Hats Protocol because it enables the creation of and management of on-chain roles, or what we call hats. This is a little bit of a preview of what Hats Protocol looks like if we visualize it. We have a bunch of roles that, at first blush, look like a strict hierarchy. But if we think about these as roles and not the actual people in the organization, we can understand that these, these are the relationships be, between the roles, between the work that needs to be done, between the actions that need to be taken to achieve the organization's goals. And we can embed a bunch of things into these roles, including authorities and responsibilities. And we can, uh, we can also identify who has these roles. We can manage who has these roles. And what is not pictured here is that we can also attach and program accountability criteria directly into the roles themselves. And that includes things like um, uh, token holdings or reputation or elections or perhaps most importantly, staking. Staking to get a role is maybe the ultimate accountability mechanism because you can be slashed if you don't follow the rules. It gives you the flexibility to operate within uh, a, a space that the DAO creates for you and do, take the actions with the DAO's shared resources that you think you need to take in order to achieve, best achieve the organization's goals. And it still gives the organization the ability to slash you, to penalize you, to punish you for breaking those rules if it judges that you've gone awry, that you've gone MIA, that you've gone rogue. So back to this concept of roles. Hats are programmable 
on-chain roles. We think they are the atomic unit of organizational structure. They are also a pure abstraction. Their power comes, their great power comes from the fact that they are almost nothing um, in, in a sense. We practice this, this concept and we espouse this concept of roles, not souls, or what we, we really say, which is hats, not heads. We abstract away the wearers from the, the hats, we, excuse me, we extract away the heads from the hats, which allows us to do amazing thing with the, with the roles themselves. And as I talked about, roles are really bundles of a bunch of different things. They are bundles of uh, responsibilities, such as the role's purpose, its tasks, and other rules that have been established for the role. There are also bundles of powers, of authorities, of, of, of permissions, like the ability to spend money or access a communication channel or, or broadcast on behalf of the organization. Crucially, like I mentioned, there are also bundles of accountabilities that we can program in, as well as qualification and granting criteria and revocation criteria. And they have programmable and composable interfaces for everything that I just described. So let's take a, a closer look at those powers, at those permissions and authorities. Like I said before, permissions and authorities really are the ability to execute actions with or on the shared resources of an organization. These are typically delegated by the organization to the individual. And this represents both an opportunity to do great things, but also a risk of capture. And so we really need strong rules to, inf or strong, strong rules to make sure that we, don't, uh, that we aren't risking capture too much. So we can have our, either have constraint enforced authorities or accountability enforced authorities. So for example, on the constraint side, maybe you can only transfer up to two ETH because the smart contract says that that's the case. Or you can only set a protocol parameter within a specified range of values. Or you cannot access Telegram unless you are in the working group that the, tele that the Telegram is for. On the accountability side, these are things like soft powers, uh, like a working group facilitator, or maybe the, the right to, to, to cast on Farcaster, but make sure that you don't cast bad things. We can't actually uh, prevent you from casting bad things, but what we can do is we can penalize you if you do so. That's the accountability enforcement. Taking a step back, the key point here is that almost all organizations have authorities or powers or permissions that are really important to achieving their goals that cut across many different domains, across on-chain and off-chain, and are enforced by, necessarily enforced by both constraints and differentially accountability. And so it's crucial that a role system for an organization, in order to enable this full spectrum of rule enforcement, the roles need to cover the entire organization. They need to extend across the entire, entire domain of the organization, across multiple domains of permissions and powers and authorities. And this is why HATS as a pure abstraction is so important. It enables those rules to cover all of those responsibilities and powers in the organization, which means that programmable accountability can be applied everywhere it's needed, in addition to all the constraint-based rules that are so important for DAOs as well. So this is why I increasingly believe that the best organizations wear hats. Thank you for coming. It's been a pleasure speaking here. And um, here are a couple ways that you can find both uh, me on, on Twitter and Farcaster, as well as uh, Hats Protocol on Twitter and Farcaster.